All right, good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Scleral Lens Education Society webinar entitled Who Needs Sclerals with Drs. Lynette Johns and Michael Lipson. Uh, Dr. Lynette Johns is a research associate at Harvard Medical School Department of Ophthalmology. She exclusively fits scleral lenses at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Waltham office. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, the Scleral Lens Education Society, and the British Contact Lens Association. Dr. Johns received the Founders Award from the AAO section of Cornea and Contact Lenses and Refractive Technologies in 2017, and the EFCLIN Award in 2018, and the Sclera Lens uh, Society Fellow of the Year Award in 2020. She has published and speaks internationally on scleral and specialty contact lenses and severe ocular surface disease. We also have Dr. Michael Lipson, uh, who has recently retired from his position as optometrist associate professor at the University of Michigan. His clinical practice involves specialty contact lenses, ortho K, keratoconus, postcorneal transplant, postrefractive surgery, and severe dry eye patients. He has published peer-reviewed clinical research studies on ortho K, vision-related quality, quality of life, myopia management, and new lens designs. He lectures nationally and internationally on those same topics. Dr. Lipson developed and validated questionnaires to uh, assess vision-related quality of life uh, for all types of vision correction, including ortho -K. He has authored chapters and textbooks on ortho -K, scleral lenses, and general contact lens topics, and is the author of the book Contemporary ortho -Keratology. He is a consultant to the specialty lens industry, emphasizing ortho -K education, and he is on the GPLI Advisory Board serves as Vice President of the Sclera Lens Education Society and served on the Sclera Lens Education Society Board for many years. So before I turn it over to Dr. Johns, this is a COPE-approved lecture. So after the conclusion of the lecture, probably actually tomorrow, you'll receive an email with two links. One will be a survey. We encourage you to fill out that survey to give us feedback for future presentations. There'll also be a 10-question multiple choice quiz. That quiz has to be answered with a 70% or better uh, score in order to receive COPE credit. Uh, once you turn in that quiz, I think we'll usually give you about 14 days to get that done. Uh, once that's submitted, you should receive your certificate and uh, credit on the uh, Arbo site within about 30 days from today. So just a heads up on that. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Johns. Well, actually, this is Dr. Lipson. Even better. And I Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to get started on some very basic things about who needs sclerals, and I'm happy to welcome you to the, uh, the meeting tonight, and I hope this is something that's very interesting to you, and uh, not just that it's something to divert you from other things that you might be doing. But anyways, obviously you're interested in scleral lenses, and you may have a variety of different experiences with sclerals, and uh, some of the beginning parts of this are a little bit more basic, but the first question that we always ask people is, why do you prescribe sclerals? Who are they for? And basically, we prescribe sclerals to provide the maximum potential vision correction for those who have compromised vision. We also prescribe those for people who have normal prescriptions that may not work with other designs. Uh, scleral lenses provide excellent comfort, and uh, with newer materials and good fitting techniques and new designs, we can enhance and maintain very, very good corneal health. Uh, the benefits of scleral lenses, besides what I just mentioned on the previous slide, mainly come from one factor that there is no bearing on the cornea. The lens is supported by its landing on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. And so it uh, also is made up of GP lens, which provides good GP optics and many, many options of different designs. Uh, the lens maintains excellent centering. It doesn't move very much on the eye, and uh, as a result, it's very, very comfortable and can be made exceptionally rotationally stable, so that will provide excellent optics. And uh, so basically, the Scleral Lens Society sponsored a uh, research and a committee to kind of determine terminology, and that was published uh, last year, actually, Contact Lens and Anterior Eye, that the definition of a scleral lens is one that does not bear on the cornea or the limbus. It uh, does, 
where other lenses, corneal, or corneal scleral lenses, whatever, a scleral lens is one that just does not bear on the cornea or the limbus. And if you want to reference that uh, article, it is available there. But just going over the basic anatomy of a scleral lens, on the front surface of the lens, we have the optic zone. And within that optic zone, we can create front surface tericity. Uh, we can create asphericity or eccentricity, both on the front or the back. And we have the potential of doing multifocal lenses, either center distance or center near. And uh, with this lens being so stable, we also have the potential to uh, decenter the optics so that uh, it enhances the effect of the multifocal lens that we've seen some new designs come out in that regard. One of the newer things that we see now is also uh, dealing with higher order aberrations and there's a lot of work being done in this now that even with standard scleral lenses that there are some corrections still showing through and uh, with some special techniques and these stable optics we can uh, custom make some very, very high-tech, higher-order aberration correcting lenses. The next major feature of scleral lenses is that it creates a fluid reservoir between the lens and the eye. So overlying the cornea is always fluid. And uh, that fluid is there in the central zone, overlying the optics and the pupil. It also is overlying the limbal zone. So we have a fluid reservoir. It's fluid, we call it fluid, not necessarily tears, because a lot of it is filled with a uh, solution that is used upon application of the lens, and that fluid stays in there for some time. It does not wash out. And that's one of the reasons you can get a picture like this on the upper left with the fluorescein. It stays in there, and you put it in with fluorescein for quite a while. So the question of tear flow under the lens is still a, a question. And uh, one of the real, real key points of a scleral lens is, and determines how it fits, is where it lands. And our goal on landing, obviously, is to get conjunctival and scleral alignment 360 degrees around the periphery so that it lands very gently, not very hard in any one spot, but gently distributes the weight of that lens onto that conjunctival overlying the sclera. And that can be done with lenses that have a set curvature, and that curvature can be made either uh, more curved or less curved to uh, help with that alignment. And there are also designs that do not have a curvature at all, but they're actually plain surfaces that are subtended at various angles. But as you can see from the uh, graphic design on the upper uh, graphic there, that's a, a point where the lens is landing directly on the sclera very evenly. And this would be a representation in the upper right uh, of an OCT. And you can see some very, very slight indentation right near the edge, and that's uh, ideal. And when the, you see the picture on the lower right, that's what you should see is that no, there's no bearing. You can see that the blood vessels are continuous under the edge, and they're not being compressed in any way. The next uh, feature we talk about is once we get that lens you know, to fit, we want to know why are we doing this? What are our goals in, in scleral prescribing? And first and foremost is, is visual rehabilitation, getting patients to see clearly who would, because of their irregular corneas, not be able to see clearly with other types of corrections. Uh, the, the picture on the lower part is a very irregular topography of land, it happens to be in China. Uh, but basically, the most common uh, irregular cornea is by far keratoconus. And uh, we use scleral lenses for many, many keratoconus, early and advanced keratoconus. But the other irregular types of corneas are created by surgery. Uh, any post-surgical cornea it has the potential for being quite irregular, including intacts, cross-linked corneas, uh, cornea transplants, any refractive surgery, the list there is not totally inclusive, but that's some of them. And then, of course, once they have these surgeries, sometimes we get secondary keratoconus or post-surgical ectasia. And those patients are very difficult to correct with other types of lenses, as we'll see in some examples to follow. So 
when you put a scleral lens on an irregular cornea, why does it work so well? Well, number one, what I just mentioned before, it has RGP optics. And it's, it's, very, it's a new surface that you're creating on the front surface, the first surface that light hits as it enters the eye. So it creates a very uniform, very smooth surface. Between the lens and the eye, there's a tear lens that's formed under there, and you can see that in the uh, OCT that's represented on the left there. And that tear lens corrects for a lot of uh, the irregularities as well. And the uh, again, this is the representation of some of the differences, the distortions that uh, keratoconus and irregular cornea patients will experience with glasses and soft lenses, and they just can't be corrected. And with the clear correction with a scleral lens, we can get much, much better optics on this. And again, as I mentioned before, you can create a lot of different types of optical uh, corrections with that RGP lens, including, you know, front surface toric or uh, anterior toric curvatures to correct any residual cylinder as well. These are some uh, topographic examples of some of these uh, irregular corneas, and uh, as you can see, you know, it's it's really, really different for each one of these. Uh, the astigmatism and irregular astigmatism varies. It's not the same in any direction. And so with glasses, obviously, or soft lenses, this just doesn't get optically corrected. And uh, the example on the left is a pellucid one. The center one is a post-graft uh, patient. And uh, I think we have a post-LASIK ectasia on the right. Uh, but basically, we, we should see with the topography, it's very asymmetric. And the point being, we have scleral lenses to take care of these situations when glasses and soft lenses cannot. Now, these are the uh, representations of naturally occurring irregular corneas, meaning keratoconus. Uh, there's two examples of keratoconus in the topography and the picture with the classic Munson sign up above. Uh, the one on the uh, middle and the bottom is the classic topographical representation of pellucid marginal degeneration, and the uh, keratoglobus on the far right, where the whole cornea is just protruded exceptionally prominently. But uh, besides the naturally occurring ones, there's surgically induced irregularities. Uh, the top topography that's shown here is a, a mild keratoconus. Uh, probably after post-LASIK, and it's uh, irregular and just as difficult to correct with glasses and contacts. Uh, we have post-LASIK, you know, picture on a slit lamp. The post-RK is uh, also very irregular, and that's a picture with a scleral lens on there. Uh, upper uh, is the uh, post-PKP patient, post-graft, and again, depending on the sutures, you get a variety of irregularities and uh, the intacts or the intracorneal rings on the lower right. Besides surgically induced things, there are traumatically induced things. Well, traumatic or post-herpetic, for example, creates quite a scar. Post-surgical pterygia is on the right there, uh, where they remove the pterygium that's causing distortion of the cornea, but the scar is left and it can sometimes interfere with the visual axis. These are the tr more traumatic things where, again, a penetrating injury, creating a scar that had to be stitched up together, going right across the visual axis, creating not only a scar and an impediment to clear vision, but uh, the sutures that are there creates very, very highly irregular astigmatism. Uh, the middle example is a, a very severe abrasion that left a scar, and uh, the one on the right is unfortunately aftermath of an ulcer that happened on the cornea, leaving scar tissue. And uh, again, that's something that limits best acuity somewhere along the way. So, in, in addition to that, there's a few other ones. Uh, we have corneal dystrophies and degenerations, and these uh, are various examples of some of the more common ones: Salzman's. Terians, uh, granular and lattice dystrophies, um, but again, these are patients that struggle with glasses, struggle with contact lenses, soft lenses, and also struggle with drying of the cornea, 
it, lid going over these irregular corneas can be irritating. So sclera, scleral lens fitting can not only be a visual rehab, but also to uh, correct for uh, protection of the cornea, as we'll see in a minute, and uh, keeping the eye more comfortable. Um, there are unique applications for scleral. In addition to just correcting vision, sometimes they're used in cases where the cornea has been uh, molded by ill-fitting uh, corneal lenses. Uh, there's corneal ectasia progression that we use sclerals for occasionally just to, again, the lens doesn't bear on the cornea, so it'll let the cornea go to its natural or where it wants to go. And uh, for management of sutures. Like I said, if you had a suture that was protruding and the blink process was going over that suture, a scleral lens over that can help manage that very nicely. Now, in addition to the function of correcting vision, what else do we use sclerals for? And this is a really, really important part, is just supporting the ocular surface. And that means basically helping maintain a wet cornea, keeping uh, the cornea protected from the blink process in addition. And so as a result, when we see this, keeping the cornea lubricated can be used to treat any level of dry eye from very, very mild ones to the most severe ones, for example, with uh, graft versus host disease. And uh, those are the kinds of patients that you'll see sitting in the chair and they have a, a glass of water in one hand and a bottle of drops in the other one, and they're drinking and dropping. Uh, they really are the most severe dry eye patients that you will see, and they get very, very almost instantaneous relief when you put a scleral lens on the eye. Next. But in addition to supporting the ocular surface, it reduces pain. And when the cornea is dry, it is a very uncomfortable situation. So when we put the scleral lens, we create a wet corneal surface creating a very comfortable cornea. Now compared to no lens at all, um, there is really no drying between blinks and uh, there's no dryness between using drops and uh, that creates a much better healthy cornea with less photophobia. And those are just representative examples of the kinds of patients that you might see with scleral lenses on the right and before. So. Again, uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is really in goals of scleral prescribing, we need to protect the ocular surface in some instances, and there are situations of recurrent corneal erosions. Um, the upper right example is an example of a large persistent epithelial defect that basically in the past we've used soft lenses for, and even with those, they do have some rubbing and movement over the surface even with a tight-fitting lens. And uh, again, when you put the scleral lens on, not only does it shield it from the blink process, it keeps the cornea wet and uh, does not dry out. And in some instances, when the lenses are applied, you can even put antibiotic in the solution that goes in there to keep the antibiotic in contact with the eye for a longer period of time. So one other consideration before you jump in and put a scleral lens on someone, is uh, endothelial cell density. And uh, we have a certain normal amount when we're born, and through the years it naturally goes down. But after certain procedures, like cataract surgery, uh, after many years with age, after corneal transplant, or even corneal diseases, especially like Fuchs, the endothelial cell density goes down significantly. and uh, you can see the numbers here on the right, but in general, when we put scleral lenses on, we're very, very cautious if we're between, I don't know, less than 800 or 1,000 uh, cells per square millimeter. If it's anything less than that, it can, uh, putting scleral lens on there, cause significant uh, corneal edema. Next. And uh, thank you. The uh, next slide just is a representation of that endothelial cell function that controls how much water gets into the cornea. And uh, we don't know, even with normal uh, endothelial cell density, sometimes scleral lens wear can alter 
corneal swelling a little bit, and it, it helps obviously maintain corneal clarity, but uh, we want to make sure that we're not hurting the eye while we're trying to correct vision and protect it. I think I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lynette at this point, but I'm going to just say on this last slide that when you think about corneal edema, there's a theoretical uh, amount that's been shown that yes, there is some swelling with scleral lenses, but clinically, uh, we just don't seem to see that. Uh, we, we're seeing that it really, people are happy with it, the cornea looks good, and uh, there's a lot of study still that needs to be done in this area to determine what is clinically significant edema and how much tear exchange actually occurs under a scleral lens. Lynette's going to show you some really wild cases now and very interesting ones, so go ahead, Lynette. Thank you. Um, so we're going to switch gears and talk uh, about scleral lenses for ocular surface disease. I apologize if some of the photos are going to be a little off-putting and graphic. Um, but when we're talking about ocular surface disease and scleral lenses, uh, we are in the middle of the resurgence of scleral lenses. But scleral lenses, as you know, were the very first contact lens that was ever developed. And here is where I'd like to highlight the fact that um, in the 60s, you can see that they were using scleral lenses made out of polymethyl methacrylate, or PMMA, which is not gas permeable, and 5% of 3,000 fits were for ocular surface disease. And so here you see 3,000 fits in 1963 just shows that, you know, we are in the resurgence now. And then, again, speaking for ocular surface disease, when we get into the GP materials, um, there's been more written about it. We owe Don Ezekiel a lot for his revolutionary use of gas permeable material in the um, 1980s uh, by when he published the first gas permeable haptic lens or scleral lens. The DK at the time was 16.4 and it was fenestrated but it was still gas permeable. The first scleral paper dedicated to ocular surface disease in gas permeable materials um, was uh, by the Vissers out of the Netherlands uh, in 1992. And here you can see the 15 different types of patients that they were talking about had keratitis sicca, neurogenic etiology, Sjogren's, um, Graves' ophthalmopathy, <laughs> sorry about that, and unknown etiology. So like Dr. Lipson said, the goals of scleral lens treatment is visual rehabilitation, attenuation of pain and reduction of symptoms using protection and lubrication as the main reason for that, and also supporting the ocular surface in addition with protection and lubrication. We have to be very clear with our patients that it's not achieving 20-20 vision. Now many patients do, but this should not be what they come in expecting because of various different pathologies they may be presenting with. Another thing that they need to know is that it's palliative, not curative. So if you're using the lens to treat dry eye, the cornea is submerged in fluid the whole time that the lens is worn, but as soon as you take that lens off, so is the liquid. So it doesn't cure their dry eye, it just supports the surface while the lens is on. And lastly, it does not eliminate the need for artificial tears or supplemental treatments. It definitely can reduce the amount of tears that are required, but it doesn't always eliminate the, the need for them, because even though the cornea is submerged in fluid, the front surface of the lens is still in a dry eye environment, and that uh, can create friction of the surface of the lens with the underside of the eyelid, so artificial tears may still be required. This is an example of a patient that came to me, and this was her question. This lens will make me 20-20, right? Well, given the, her state of the eye, um, you can see that her pupil is completely covered by that tissue. She had Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and she actually got into this predicament with an ill-fitting scleral lens, and the lens had created 
some surface abnormalities, so we have to be very careful on how we fit it. And she had to stop wearing the lens. The surface broke down. She perforated her cornea. She had a transplant. She perforated that cornea and she was about to perforate the next transplant and what they did was a mucosal membrane graft but instead of doing it on the eyelids they did it across the cornea itself to protect the cornea do i think she will be 2020 i think there's a possibility for this because the lens when fit properly will uh, optimize the surface, lubricate the surface, and potentially allow a really good environment for her to have that mucous membrane graft removed and potentially get back to seeing clearly again with a new cornea. So there's a little secret to fitting some diseased eyes. They actually have normal uh, scleral shape, except in cicatrizing disease, so I have to have that disclaimer. So they're not always that challenging to fit, even though their condition can be quite challenging. So some helpful hints to help you with some of these uh, severe dry eye patients. Um, <clears throat> if a patient is uh, severely photophobic or is in severe amount of pain, typically I don't use an a topical anesthetic. But in these patients, if they really have a strong blepharospasm and they just cannot tolerate their, their eyes being held open, that's when you can use a topical anesthetic. What I also like to do is to use a, is a, a, a viscous gel drop in the lens and that prevents bubble formation because the lens doesn't spill as you're trying to apply the lens. In these patients that are really uncomfortable and dry, um, you may want to reduce the amount of attempts that you have to get the lens in. So you, you don't want to run into bubble trouble. Um, the other thing too, another hint, is to start with a small diameter, especially in these patients with Stevens-Johnson syndrome or cicatrizing disease, which will cover in a few minutes um, because you can apply the lens more easily when it's smaller and then once you assess the fit if you want to have more coverage once the patient's familiar with what the expectation of the lens to feel like then they will actually do quite well with application um, of lenses and you can try a larger lens and the other thing too is to desensitize their reflexes to application. Sometimes they have a strong blepharospasm, so you need to just kind of relax their eyes. And sometimes they have a strong Bell's phenomenon and you have to get them to visualize a target so that both eyes keep looking downward. So <clears throat> let's talk about when every drop counts in the surface of these severe dry eyes. What type of eyes are we talking about? Here we're talking about keratoconjunctivitis sicca, and that can be aqueous deficient dry eye, where the Schirmer's scores are extraordinarily low, lacrimal gland dysfunction or deficiency in cases of sarcoid, lymphoma, graft versus host disease, like Dr. Lipson talked about, lacrimal gland duct obstruction, and typical dryness that comes along with aging, or just the um, a lacrima that's congenital as well. Now, when you have these severe dry eye patients, they might develop filamentary keratitis. And one thing that I have found that's great is you don't have to debride these corneas if they're wearing a scleral lens. The filaments kind of float right off if they're in a lens for a full day. So um, that's one really nice perk of having these lenses in these severe dry eye patients. Sjogren's syndrome we're very familiar with. It's uh, uh, a a syndrome that affects the lacrimal and salivary glands. 95% are female. They have dry eye, dry mouth, xerostomia, and it can be associated with blood tests, serologic autoantibodies. So the rheumatoid factor, ANA, and then there's two specific Sjogren's syndrome factors, uh, factor A and B that um, can be associated. And, and a lot of times you can do a lip biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. Secondary Sjogren's is associated with autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis. So here secondary Sjogren's can be uh, 15 to 25% of rheumatoid arthritis patients. And there you have a host of ocular surface conditions like sclerosing keratitis, lipid deposition, peripheral thinning, just to name a few. Lupus is yet another autoimmune condition 
And these patients can have a secondary Sjogren's syndrome as well. And here you have the classic butterfly rash that you can see in the photo. Again, there's a female predilection for the condition. And there's also just a lot of corneal issues with just basic staining to peripheral ulcerative keratitis and marginal uh, infiltrative ulceration. Now, graft-versus-host disease, if you're not familiar with that, that's when a patient that had a bone marrow or stem cell transplant uh, for cancer or lymphoma, the transplant itself, the stem cells or the bone marrow cells, recognize the recipient tissue, so the host tissue, as foreign. So it affects um, the mouth, it affects definitely the eyes, the skin, the lungs, the GI tract, um, so it's it can be very debilitating and it can also be fatal. Um, the acute form is within the first 90 to 100 days and the chronic form can affect uh, any time, you know, after that period and it affects 60 to 90 percent of patients who had bone marrow transplants. This is an example of the unpredictability of graft-versus-host disease. On the left, this patient had a Gunderson flap where the conjunctiva was sewn over the cornea to pre protect the cornea from eroding itself because it had an epithelial defect. 20 years later, the other eye ended up having an epithelial defect, but we were able to um, we were able to uh, resurface the cornea with a scleral lens. So <clears throat> corneal stem cell deficiencies are yet another reason for scleral lenses. Stevens-Johnson syndrome, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, thermal injuries, aniridia, radiation keratopathy, and contact lens-induced limbal stem cell deficiency. This is an example of Stevens-Johnson syndrome where you get this severe reaction to an antibiotic or a drug, and it's um, preceded by uh, a fever and, <clears throat> and a sore throat, cough. So a lot of times it's just like any other illness, but then you see this macular erythematous rash with bullae that happen all over the surface of the body. So you see these two ring target lesions and ultimately lead into shedding sheets of skin. So these patients can also have a more severe form, which, you know, if SJS isn't bad enough, they can have toxic epidermal necrolysis. And in that case, the skin loss is greater than 20% of the body. It's uh, both of these conditions can be fatal. And these patients end up losing sheets of skin. And this is an example of TEN syndrome where you can see the sheets of skin uh, peeling right off. And these patients might be put into uh, medically induced comas while they're trying to recover. But some of the things that these patients encounter after they've recovered is panis. You can see this is uh, two, this is the same patient. You can see at least his pupil was spared in this eye, but you get this dense fibrotic tissue. So here this, the, the patient would get benefits from the lubrication as well as they would get visual rehabilitation in these cases. <clears throat> Ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, you can have this chronic recurring inflammation ulceration, you end up getting fornicele foreshortening. Here's an example of some blepharon, an ankyloblepharon where the lid is actually sutured to the, um, to the cornea, uh, not sutured, but uh, scarred to the cornea itself. <clears throat> Next, we want to talk about protection against a hostile environment. This poor turtle ended up in somebody's windshield, but hopefully we don't have any flying projectiles into a patient with a scleral lens, but if you do, the surface can protect, the surface of the lens can protect the eye. This is an example of trichiasis and dystichiasis in patients with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, where you get these little misdirected lashes, or in this case, dystichiasis is where lashes grow out of the meibomian glands, and they can scratch the surface of the eye. And you can see this foreign body tracking that occurred uh, shortly after a scleral lens was removed. So it can be really uncomfortable for these patients. Keratinization in these patients can also scrape across the cornea of the eye and cause intense scarring. 
Um, exposure keratitis, that's another reason why these lenses are so protective in nature. If you can't close your eyes, you're, you're um, inevitably um, in, unprotected against the environment. And so these, these lenses not only lubricate the surface of the eye, but protect the eye from the eye not being able to close. So for instance, Bell's palsy, um, you can see these patients with, uh, you know, a mononeuropathic paralysis of the seventh nerve or the facial nerve. It's oftentimes unilateral, but sometimes can be bilateral. And, you know, many times it does resolve, but these patients are so dry and unable to blink that they might not be able to retain a soft contact lens. So you'd be able to actually put a scleral lens to not only um, lubricate the surface, but also protect the eye while it's unable to close. Mubia syndrome is yet another patient, um, uh, another syndrome that causes exposure of the eye. It's an underdeveloped sixth and seventh nerve, but the fifth and eighth can also be involved. So they have strabismus. They can have limb abnormalities, as you can see here. So you have to be very creative when learning, when teaching somebody how to put in and take out a lens when they have missing fingers. And so there's a lot of different uh, associations with this condition, but again, seventh nerve uh, uh, paralysis or underdevelopment is what causes the exposure where the scleral lenses can help. Now, this is yet another interesting condition, acoustic neuroma. Acoustic neuroma is a rare benign tumor that happens on the eighth nerve sheath, and so it compresses the seventh nerve. And in doing so, um, when you have to resect the actual tumor that you can see here, they end up having to um, dissect the facial nerve, and so you get a chronic exposure. Now this patient, we asked him to close his eyes, and you can see he can't close his, his, his right eye. It's completely exposed. This poor gentleman had a resection of the tumor, which leaves that side deaf, and also um, creates uh, this extreme exposure. And so he had the tumor resected, the cornea perforated because of exposure. He had a penetrating keratoplasty, then a tarsorophy. The graft started to break down, so he had a lamellar keratoplasty, then yet a second um, penetrating keratoplasty, and then finally he had a scleral lens. This could all be avoided if he was actually fit with a scleral lens immediately after the acoustic neuroma resection. So this is an opportunity to coordinate care with neurologists and be able to uh, work with different patients that can uh, be referred to your office. So this is just a case of bizarre um, plastic surgery. This poor woman had a total of 38 facial and oculoplastic surgeries. And you can see that we asked her to close her eyes and you can see how much exposure there is when the eye was closed. Um, so this is where the lens can actually really provide uh, protection and lubrication. Yet another case, patient that had a bad blepharoplasty that's dense, dense staining, and after four and a half hours of scleral lens wear, you can see that that staining goes away. So these patients can really benefit from the hydration of the lenses. And again, you have trauma, and this patient can ha has extreme exposure, and so this can be really helpful for those patients. When the cornea is unplugged, so neurotrophic corneas where they're numb, congenital corneal anesthesia, there's different cases of it, familial dysautonomia, Mubia syndrome, golden Har syndrome, and hereditary autonomic sensory neuropathy are all reasons that you can have congenital cornea anesthesia. Familial dysautonomia seems to be the most common case of corneal anesthesia, and these patients have all unstable blood pressure, body temperature, swallowing, and breathing problems, so you can actually fit them at a very young age. This patient uh, was basically uh, a few months old when she was fit. 
Golden Haar syndrome is yet another rare um, uh, congenital craniofacial uh, abnormality, and these patients do have a corneal numbness. Now, in this case, you can see they have dermoids, and this is where it really helps to know your scleral lens designs, where you can have focal area vaults um, or edge lifts in this area to vault appropriately over this or put in channels or bevels into the lens to accommodate these um, growths. Um, acquired neurotrophic corneas can be uh, the acoustic neuroma that we discussed already, trigeminal ganglionectomy, um, herpes simplex and zoster, and diabetes. You can see this is a definitely a herpetic case where you see the dendrites, and this is in a case of a non-healing epithelial defect that just didn't heal and we could see the dendrites starting to form, whereas this is a case of a diabetic patient that had a neurotrophic cornea. There's also reasons to fit patients with uh, scleral lenses for normal corneas, high emetropia, astigmatism, presbyopia, and aphakia, and those patients that are active in sports. So scleral lenses for normal corneas, the study looked at 36 different subjects that, had, that were myopic with astigmatism that were basically fit with a scleral lens versus a toric lens, and half preferred to stay with the scleral lens after the completion of the study, and the majority preferred the scleral lens visual acuity. There are other unique applications, um, management of persistent epithelial defects. You can wear a scleral lens on extended wear where the lens is taken out once a day and cleaned and disinfected. For longer um, persistent epithelial defects, you can teach the patient how to, to insert and remove their own lenses and you give them two lenses that one's being cleaned while the one lens is worn and then it's exchanged at night. So you, there's always two lenses being worn. And you also use a prophylactic antibiotic moxifloxacin, which is preservative-free in the lens. And this is an example of a non-healing epithelial defect that was six months old that healed in about five days. There's also other unique applications of apoptosis prop that was reported in the literature. And then, like Dr. Lipson talked about, HOA corrections, higher order aberration corrections. Here's an example of the higher order aberrations in keratoconus through a scleral lens. So it even looks like keratoconus topography, but this is significant coma and trefoil that was that basically was corrected with an HOA lens. And in this study, 11 eyes were treated, and there's an improvement in two lines of visual acuity. And in this particular study by another group, the wavefront lenses improved the vision um, by 50% in 85% of cases with the wavefront lenses. So there's some excellent applications for these particular lenses. And Dr. Lipson's going to finish off this presentation. Well, basically at this point, I get to talk about um, <clears throat> all of these patients that Lynette was going over. Basically, they benefit from scleral lenses, and <clears throat> scleral lenses can improve um, the vision for these patients. But it, what I'm going to talk about here really is not just what these scleral lenses do for the eye, but what it does for the patient. And we're talking about vision-related quality of life. So when you improve the vision, patients become more functional, functional and employable, and their eyes become more comfortable, and just they feel better. <laughs> There's nothing else to say about that. They feel better. Okay, next. And uh, this is just, again, an example of just seeing clearly. So next. So what we're going to talk about here is when we talk about improved vision, we talked about helping the vision. Here's studies that are showing this, that patients who had corneal irregularity, like keratoconus or other scars, um, their mean VA improvement was about 0.4 to 0.1 logmar. That's about 2050 vision down to about 2025. And the ocular surface people improved uh, a little bit less because basically those people still can see well many times, but it doesn't last. They, between blinks, their vision degrades, things like that. But in any event, all of these kinds of patients, both the irregular cornea and the ocular surface disease patients, get better vision with scleral lenses. 
after we get done with this part of it, by the way, we're going to have room for some questions here. So, um, and this is a graphical representation of this, uh, some of the higher order aberrations and the improvements and the decreased higher order aberrations. Um, in this particular study, they were using uh, a variety of different lenses, but uh, their baseline uh, VA went uh, to 2020, basically, in this situation. Okay. Another improvement in quality of life is they don't have to use drops as much. Basically, these ocular surface disease or dry eye patients were taken into a, one particular study, and uh, they were using drops about three to four times a day, and it was down to less than two drops a day. So less symptoms of discomfort. And of the people who were switched from no lenses to scleral lenses, 81% reported marked relief in their ocular discomfort when they wore their scleral lenses. The uh, symptoms, things that people feel when they have dry eyes, when they have certain uh, other ocular surface conditions are itching, dryness, irritation, burning, in addition to light sensitivity, and their symptoms are definitely less with scleral lenses. And these were two um, what we call patient-reported outcomes or questionnaires that were done. Uh, the first one was this VFQ, which is a visual function quality, uh, which has been used for various types of um, refractive conditions. And uh, pre-scleral lenses, their scores were 47. They went up to 77 with scleral lenses. Another study that did the same um, questionnaire, they went from 58 to 86. So 86, the higher the score, the better. Just the reverse, on the OSDI, the dry eye uh, survey, the higher the score, the worse the dry eye is. So again, the lower the score, like on this one, it went from 51 down to 13, and that's very, very significant improvement or less dryness while they were wearing scleral type lenses. But at the end of all these questionnaires, there is an overall score that they get. There's different attributes, and I'll go over in just a second on the next slide, but overall improvements in their vision-related quality of life. 79% basically reported better comfort when they wore scleral lenses versus whatever they were wearing previously in their contact lenses. Um, about the same amount reported better visual acuity, and about almost 90% of the patients reported better overall satisfaction with their eyes and with their vision. And uh, this, is, this was a study done by the Vissers over in... Uh, the Netherlands, basically, they've been using scleral lenses for quite some time, and they're very, very prominent fitters over there. But you can be assured that if you put somebody in a scleral lens, they're going to notice improvements. Next. Next, please. Now, when we do these uh, designs for validating questionnaires, there are a number of different attributes that go into determining quality of life and specifically vision-related quality of life. But objectively, some of these you can measure in your exam room, like on the left, the, the visual acuity, both high and low contrast. Um, you could actually measure higher order aberrations. You could look at the slit lamp and evaluate how much staining there is or keratitis and other dry eye signs that you might see, um, other staining, uh, other tear testing, things like that. You can do all those tests to evaluate objectively if they've gotten better. But the purpose of these questionnaires really is to find out what is the patient feeling. And basically, they're evaluating this. And these are all the things that improve with scleral lenses. The vision, less glare. Comfort is better. They have less symptoms, longer wearing time than their previous lenses. Uh, lenses don't move as much or dislodge. And they don't get things under the lens like they do would with a corneal lens. Um, they are less photophobic. and uh, Really, a big, big improvement in quality of life is if they can go into scleral lenses and eliminate the need for a corneal transplant, that's huge, a huge improvement in their overall quality of life and saving them some money and hassle of going through all that. Next. As far as uh, any negative effects of scleral lenses on their vision-related quality of life, really has to do with only a couple things. One, they have to learn how to 
put the lenses in, remove them, care for them properly, and uh, obviously there may be some negative effect relative to higher cost, but and how much time is involved in their ongoing maintenance as well. But when put all together with all the positives, most patients look at these things as very, very minor, and there is really no price you can put on improving your quality of life. And uh, really for these uh, validated instruments for scleral lenses, all of these things that have been used in the past to evaluate quality of life and all of these ones that are done in the studies are not really validated for use with scleral lenses. They were used for refractive error, for certain diseases of cataracts, the OSDI specifically for dry eyes. But for scleral lenses, this was something that uh, I worked on and developed with a psychometrics expert to develop a quality of life instrument that is validated for use with all types of lenses, scleral, corneal, soft, and orthokay as well. Finally, there is something to bring up relative to safety. Uh, with scleral lenses, there is a potential for some complications, but they are very few, uh, definitely less than other lens wear modalities. But again, complications can be minimized when they are compliant with lens care and compliant with follow-up care. Obviously, we have to put a little asterisk with that now, uh, given the current situation with follow-up care, and uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the patient to uh, help talk to the doctor and, and find out when is the time that they really have to be seen and the doctor has to express that to the patient that some of these visits can be done through telemedicine but some of them they still have to come in for. So finally as, as a summary with vision related quality of life with scleral lenses compared to other modalities it's just a big big advantage it's huge the, the, they have less symptoms of dryness Patients feel that they are less restricted in their activities because they can see better and they're less light sensitive so they can be outside in the wind and uh, their acuity is so much better that they're able to do certain things that they couldn't do otherwise. They're, they're affected with less glare, less aberrations, monocular diplopia and especially vision at night. But again, when you're making a patient more comfortable and they can wear lenses all day and see well all day, uh, lenses are not dislodging. The bottom line is that they have a better quality of life. They see better, they're more comfortable, and they are overall more functional. So the title of our presentation today was Who Needs Sclerals? Well, you saw a lot of examples of those, those irregular corneal patients, but the patients need it. Any specialty patients who are not adequately corrected with soft lenses, with glasses, with other types of lenses, and basically who need their quality of life improved. Um, your practice needs scleral lenses because it's an area of growth and additional revenue for you, but I think for yourself, it, it's a little selfish, but you feel like you can provide higher level of service, you can provide service to more patients with all these various conditions. You may see these come in, even though some of them are fairly rare, some of them are very common, but specifically keratoconus and all these post-surgical, post-refractive surgery patients. There's a lot of them out there and a lot of them need better vision than what they are doing now. So I think if we skip to the next slide, this is our thank you for attending and uh, we have some questions. I don't know uh, how we're going to do this right now, but... Uh, I, uh, I'm going to ask them to you. Go right ahead. <laughs> so we've got we've got a few. Uh, a lot of them are pretty darn similar, so I'm going to try to summarize this. Uh, basically, a two-part question. One, with a lot of the diseased corneas that were covered today, do you find that they have increased oxygen demands? And then if yes, do you have any recommendations on diameter or vault uh, over these more compromised corneas as it relates to either oxygen demands or just reservoir height? Go ahead, Annette. Lynette. <clears throat> so oxygen is a controversial topic, and um, in my experience, even fitting, I, I fit very large diameter lenses, uh, upwards near 23 millimeters, so sometimes they have quite substantial clearances, especially in keratoglobus patients, um, where you really have to 
bridge over these highly ectatic corneas. And I have not seen any evidence of corneal edema, um, no neovascularization, and in fact, in some of these severely diseased patients with Stevens-Johnson syndrome, where they have that dense panis, I actually see that the neovascularization ends up ghosting. So in those cases, while you'd think you know, you have to be very careful with oxygen. I think when you support the surface, you lubricate the surface, and you provide um, adequate clearance over the limbus, and you don't compress near the limbus, um, and you just have an evenly balanced fit, like Dr. Lipson was talking about in the beginning of this presentation. Um, it's really uh, balances all of the needs that you have to protect the corneal surface and to balance the physiology of the eye. Dr. Lipson? Um, I would just say that, again, repeat just what you said, uh, I think that just vaulting the cornea um, in, in some of these cases that are not so extreme as some of the ones that you showed, but in a, say for example, a graft versus host disease patient, generally they have pretty normal corneal shape and probably very normal conjunctival shape. And it's a matter of getting that lens aligned 360 degrees. And uh, some of the scleral topographers help do that, help you do that even before you put the first lens on the eye. So you know what that scleral topography is. Okay, and we had a question. Uh, if you are seeing edema, um, is there ever a time where you uh, recommend fenestration of the lenses? Uh, I personally do not fenestrate lenses. Sometimes I um, ask patients to take lenses out midday for a couple hours if they can, and certainly uh, try to use the highest permeable material available. Lynette. I have used fenestrations in patients with failing grafts um, because of the low endothelial cell count, but it's interesting because if you look at the endothelial cell count, it doesn't tell you the whole picture. In fact, I had a patient wearing scleral lenses for years and his endothelial cell count was 450. Um, so he didn't need fenestrated lenses, and in fact, I had a patient whose corneal graft decompensated with 1,200 cells per millimeter square, and they needed uh, fenestration. And in fact, the fenestrations helped the patient double their wearing time. Now, I don't know if it had to do with um, oxygenation or if it had to do with alleviating suction, but somehow the fenestration does work in failing grafts. The biggest problem is fitting it properly so that the bubble doesn't go over the visual axis. But when a fenestrated lens is applied to the eye, unlike a sealed lens, the bubble is mobile and so it doesn't create that discomfort that a sealed lens with a bubble does. And then, and then we know that, stay on the same topic, all uh, corneas, or most corneas, even under soft lenses, show some degree of edema. What would be your kind of cutoff for uh, significant edema under a scleral lens? I don't know if I have a, a, a pat answer for that. I would say certainly if it becomes symptomatic for the patient where it affects acuity and you know that it's related to the edema directly, um, that would be a limitation there. Um, I guess overall, I have just found that a, a well-fit scleral lens, the edema is really not clinically evident. I, I tend to agree with Dr. Lipson, and my my hallmark signs are, and, and it's particularly in the cases of uh, patients that have transplants, um, they will notice Sattler's veil if they have edema. So they will see rainbows around lights. And in fact, if I'm concerned about an old graft that has a low endothelial cell count, I actually challenge the transplant. So I have the patient, um, I can put the lens in in the morning of the, their visit and then see them at the end of the day. And I have them check themselves every hour with their light on their phone just to see if there's rainbows around the light. If there is, they come in sooner. If there isn't and they do well for six hours, then we know that at minimum they can wear the lens for six hours before edema ensues and they can go ahead and wear the lens. Um, 
And we also have to keep in mind that even on keratoconus patients, uh, they can have Fuchs endothelial dystrophy too. So sometimes you see gute with, uh, with corneal lactasia. So those patients you just have to be mindful of and make sure that they don't see those rainbows as well. And in severe ocular surface disease, you can just have poor tight junctions. So then you can see um, actual tiny micro bullae or even some substantial bullae that form under a scleral lens trial after a few hours. And those patients, I I, if I see the bullet, I don't recommend them continuing with a scleral lens fit. With the ocular surface disease patients, do you find more issues with post-lens uh, tear layer clouding and the need to uh, remove and refill throughout the day? My personal experience is no, that can happen to any patient. <laughs> um, I think the uh, ocular surface disease patients are generally just very, very symptomatically grateful for having a scleral lens, but they're so much more comfortable. I agree. Um, the The problem that I find more with the severe ocular surface disease patients, it's not behind the lens or underneath the lens, that type of debris in the reservoir, it's on the front surface of the lens. So sometimes they are served well with uh, um, uh, polyethylene glycol treatments to the surface, and sometimes you just teach them how to do an on-eye surface cleaning with using um, a, their, their actual removal plunger. Instead of putting it straight on where you'd take the lens off, you actually have it held almost like a T to the surface, put a little saline on it, and they can clean the window themselves, or they just take the lens off midday refresh the solution and put that on. So um, those patients that don't create enough tears, we encourage them to lubricate the surface with topical preservative free artificial tears and, um, and that can help, but sometimes the debris just sticks to the surface and that can I, be a problem. I've seen that as well, I've seen that as well and it, uh, it can work well, this lubrication technique that you described. Any preference uh, on filling solutions, buffered versus non-buffered, for these patients? Go ahead, Lynette. Um, <clears throat> it depends on the patient. Uh, sometimes, as you know, the buffer uh, protects the, uh, the, the pH to maintain in a certain level. So in some patients, they're sensitive to the buffer, and in some patients, the non-buffered saline, the pH can go low over time, and so they can be sensitive to a little burning and stinging. So it's, it's kind of sometimes uh, a, 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 you have to try different solutions for your patients. Would agree that occasionally you have to be like a little uh, experimentation, <laughs> meaning that uh, Lynette happened to uh, cover this a little bit. Some people will put in uh, a little more viscous solution, and if you put maybe uh, in some patients, it's helpful to put maybe one drop of a more viscous solution in before you put the the uh, saline in. Um, that's helped in some people. So for, for the patients with, especially with surface wetting issues, do you uh, lean toward low DK materials to help with that, or do you go higher DK to improve oxygen transmission or a combination of the two? Well, that's a difficult one. You have to kind of go and, and experiment with the patient a little bit to see which works best. But most of the lenses, just because of the way they're fit, are, are fit with uh, around 100 DK materials. and uh, some of the higher DK materials, the highest ones I definitely use for all of those uh, post-graft patients where we are more concerned about oxygen. And a couple questions about the wavefront guided or, or wavefront uh, optimized lenses. Do you have any recommendations on lens types? Well, I know they're just getting involved in manufacturing these now, but it has to be coordinated with a wavefront sensor. And uh, in other words, I would say a normal fit would be done with a standard lens doing a wavefront evaluation over the lens and then creating a special wavefront 
aberration correcting lens. Those lenses can be made exceptionally stable with uh, uh, peripheral toric curves. And then I'm going to end it. We had a lot of questions about it because it's a hot topic of sclerals in 2020. It doesn't really relate to this lecture, but uh, can either of you speak on uh, intraocular pressure changes underneath scleral lenses and what we know at this point? Dr. Lipson? On that? Uh, you're going to send it to me. Yeah. <laughs> there are a number of studies that are, are done on this now, and I think it's very difficult to study this because um, one that was published by uh, Dr. Michaud from uh, Montreal was done with a, a pressure sensing device that checked the uh, eye pressure through the sclera or through the lens or through the lid uh, in various ways that are very not as consistent or not as accurate. Um, obviously, tests that are done while the lens is on, it's difficult to measure pressure. Uh, the process of removing a lens sometimes can change the pressure. So if you do a, a test immediately afterwards, it could be affected. Um, I, I think it, it could be a concern, but it hasn't been proven to be one yet. It's uh, especially for those who already are known to have glaucoma, it would be something to check definitely more carefully. But um, since clinically we don't have those types of devices that were checked, it's just something that needs to be watched over time. I don't know if you have anything to add to that or not. I agree. And the other thing, too, we have to be mindful of is, uh, sure, if, if, if IOP is uh, impacted, we have to also always just watch the nerve. I mean, there might be other compensatory mechanisms at play. So um, I, I think, you know, as long as you're diligent on watching the nerve, as well as the IOP after the lens comes out, I mean, that's the best we can do at this point in time until more studies are showing. Because the studies at this point, like Dr. Lipson said, there's some conflicting reports, but, you know, it depends on how the lens, how the IOP was measured, too. So. Beautiful. Well, I think we will end it there. Thank you both. That's a, a wonderful lecture on the uh, life-changing ability of scleral lenses. Thank you, uh, everyone, for, for joining us.